let's move on directly to the last panel discussion, which will be focusing on clean energy transition. The discussion will be moderated by Mrs. Irina Nadirini. She's um, a sustainable energy expert at the Energy Community Secretariat, where she's supporting contracting parties in developing sustainable energy policy and legislation and integrating energy and climate planning. So without any further ado, I would like to ask Irina to, um, to start the discussion. Uh, please note that you have, let's say, until five to five, let's say, maximum, and um, so that you have also time to, to discuss with the panelists. Please, Irina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Elodie. Uh, good afternoon to all the participants and the panelists of panel three. Um, that is focusing on providing voices from the coal regions, specifically on the issues on uh, clean energy transition. When we talk about clean energy transition, of course, we mean that um, it should ensure a move from fossil fuels uh, to realizing their full potentials of renewable energy uh, in the regions. At the same time, uh, a clean energy transition cannot be uh, other than just and inclusive. So it should include the full recognition of rights of workers and citizens of the local communities, equal participation when it comes to decision making, and of course it should be based uh, most importantly on dialogue with the local residents uh, and uh, stakeholders and in their interest. So today with me I have um, a large and amazing group of panelists. Uh, they have been working on the issue of clean energy transition from uh, uh, different uh, perspectives. Uh, let me briefly introduce uh, the panelists that we have here today. Um, Mr. Igor Golubovic, Mayor of Slavia in Montenegro, that is a very important city and on the media right now for the, the carbon power plant. We have with us also uh, Ms. Sonia Riskeska, she's project manager on Southeast Europe in Agora and Elpivende, and she's also uh, coming from uh, the region, from North Macedonia. We have with us also Victor Berishai, is the Energy and Climate Policy Coordinator for Southeast Europe at Climate Action Network, Can Europe in Brussels. So Victor is also um, from Kosovo himself. And we have Rinora Goyani, Program and Operation Manager at the Balkan Green Foundation. Uh, we, we will also launch next week our Just Transition Forum. And last but not least, we have an additional speaker with us today, Ms. Jovanka. Uh, Bogavac. She's a member of the Parliament of Montenegro and of the Committee for Economy, Finance and uh, Budget. Uh, we don't have much time, we have to be very efficient uh, for a minute, actually less than that. So I will start with the very first question for um, the Mayor of Flavia, for Mr. Igor Kulubovic. And the question will be um, the following. First of all, what would be the priority areas in programs for the development of, of Flavia, taking into account the, um, the importance of workers, the rights of the citizens, and also how can a municipality like Flavia involve citizens early on in decision-making processes? And on this, I will give the floor to Mr. Globovic, please. Thank you very much, Irina. I'm very glad to be the part of the today's session and to be the panelist. And because of the shortage of the time, I will uh, talk further in Montenegro. Uh, as you know, uh, I'm coming from uh, Montenegro. I come from Montenegro. Montenegro is, as I said, the largest country in the region, but it's divided as an ecological country. Potpisnica i sa usvojim deklaracijama Kyoto protokola, Parijskog sporazuma i Sofijske deklaracije. Znači, otvorili smo sva poglavlja na putu ka Evropskoj uniji i potpisnici smo Evropske zajednice. Na taj način smo se jasno predijelili i prihvatili sve obaveze koje se vežu za zdravu, to je čistu životnu sredinu, prije svega na... u vazduhu. S druge strane, Crna Gora je mala zemlja sa veoma malom eksploatacijom uglja i proizvodnjom električne energije i skorstvenih goriva u poređenju sa zemljama regiona i zemljama Evropske unije sa potrošnjom oko milijon i pol tona uglja godišnji i proizvodnjom energije i skorstvenih goriva između 1,4 i 1,5 
teravat sati godišnje. Ali energetski predsjednik opštine je veoma važan. Zašto? Zato što u prijedima imamo 1500 direktnih radnih mjesta vezanih za energetski sektor, između 1500 i 2000 indirektnih radnih mjesta, 30% budžeta opštine do 35% budžeta opštine se realizuje iz energetskog sektora, a crna godina Sad je opet ok, prepostavljam. Dobro, ako imamo problema sa video pozivom, prepostavljam da me čujete. Ono što su najbitnije, najveći problemi koje ja uočavam u zelenoj tranziciji s kojima se suočava Crna Gora i prije svega opština Prijevlja, kao energetski jedin energetski region u Prijeljima su totalna neinformisanost svih društvenih i prirednih činilaca o potrebi za zelenom tranzicijom i razlozima za nju u Crnoj gori i mojoj opštini. Totalna nespremnost lokalne zajednice, mislim i Crne gore, ali prije svega lokalne zajednice za tranziciju radnih mjesta, poslova i poslova u zelenu održivu ekonomiju. Jedan od veoma bitnih problema je ne koordinacija državnog i lokalnog nivoa u osmišljavanju aktivnosti u ovoj oblasti. Također, kroz zelenu tranziciju se suočavamo sa kompletnom nedefinisanošću rešavanja ekoloških problema koji se mogu, koji se otvaraju zatvaranjem termoletane prijevlja i rudnih kuglja u prijevljima. Postiću vas da je rudnih kuglja u prijevljima otvoreni kop, dimenzija kilometar i po sa dva kilometra, dubine 250 metara u neposobnoj blizini grada, sa velikim vodama koji ulaze u kop i velikom potrebom za regulacijom tog otvornog kopa po završetku eksploatacije. Peta opasnost leži u totalnoj zavisnosti lokalne ekonomije i radnih mjesta od rada termoelektrane rudnika u Gljepljevima i ogromna zavisnost lokalnog budžeta od funkcionisanja energetskog sektora u našem energetskom regionu. Što je ono što ja vidim da lokalna uprava, i tim odgovara na vaša pitanja, jeste da se javna kampanja mora biti intenzivna. Javna kampanja mora biti kvalitetno osmišljena, mora biti intenzivna i mora početi odmah. Jer danas je, kao što sam rekao, totalna neinformisanost građana Crne Gore i Pljevalja o potrebi za zelenom tranzicijom. Moraju se donijeti jasni planovi sa jasnim rokovima koji definišu akcijone planove sa hodogramom na putu ka zelenoj tranziciji i održivoj zelenoj ekonomiji. U tom periodu moramo naći novac za ulaganja u zašnu sredinu za posledice gašenja energetskog, koje dovode posledicom gašenja energetskog svetra u pjevljima, osmisliti kreditne linije i definisati razna mjesta koja su potrebna da bi se nadomislila radna mjesta iz energetskog sektora. I ono što je jako bitno, energetski region Pljevalja ima veliku šansu u energetskoj tranziciji zato što razvojem drugih djelatnosti mogu se lako nadomjestiti radna mjesta, ali to treba kvalitetno osmisliti i stvoriti kreditna sredstva, gran sredstva da se ulaže u razvoj poloprivrede, razvoj turizma, razvoj drvoprirade, i razvoj industrije građevinskog materijala gdje je potencijal za tim aktivnostima u sjeveru Crne Gore, odnosno u prijevodskom rudarskom energetskom regionu, jako veliki. Pozivam također i energetsku zajednicu da učini sve da i zemlje koje su na putu ka Evropskoj uniju imaju šansu za korišćenjem novca iz fondova Evropske unije za energetsku pravednu zelenu transformaciju, odnosno zelenu ekonomiju.
Thank you very much, Igor, for your intervention. Um, I think you really uh, wrapped up all the important elements that are necessary when it comes to call phase out. You mentioned the importance of coordinating at local level, uh, to have people on board and to be fully informed. And of course, the problems that there are lack of coordination between the central government and the local government, lack of campaign, uh, and of course, uh, the importance of having a date. So a deadline uh, when it comes to call phase out. And the last but not least, uh, funds to invest and uh, new jobs opportunities that, uh, as you said, are possible, but have planned very well. Before giving the floor to, to Sonia for her presentation, I would like uh, to jump to Jovanka Bogavac, uh, because she's also a member of the Parliament of Montenegro and she's representing uh, the government, if you want, the Parliament. So um, maybe I will just give the floor to her for a very short intervention of uh, five minutes and to have a, a perspective also on uh, on this. Um, Jovanka, are you with us? Do you want to take the floor? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, please, Jovanka. You can hear me. Yes. yes. OK. Good afternoon, everybody. Dobar dan svima. Poštovane kolege i ostali učesnici ove inicijative, zadovoljstvo mi je što prisustujem današnji panel diskusiji. Želala bih da pozdravim održavanje ovakvog događaja. Vrlo mi je drago kao poslanik u parlamentu Crne Gore, po zanimanju rudarski inženjer i kao neko ko prethodnih 20 godina radi u proizvodnji uglja, da se ovoj temi posveti pažnja, ceneći da je ovakva inicijativa potrebna zemljama regiona i da je treba iskoristiti za razmenu iskustava, nalaženje zajedničkih rešenja za izazove kojima smo svi u ovoj delatnosti suočeni, kao i sagledavanju potencijalnih mogućnosti saradnje. Kao što je rekao predsjednik opštine Pljevlja, gospodin Golubović, kada je ova tema u pitanju, neophodno je napomenuti trenutan status termoenergetskog sektora Crne Gore. Energetski sistem Crne Gore je u velikoj meri oslonjen na proizvodnju električne energije iz termoelektrane Pljevlja, koja se pogoni ugljem iz istoimenog rudnika i kao sistem imaju veoma značajan ekonomski i socijalni uticaj na privredu i građane. Planirani procenat učešća termoenergije u ukupnom bilansu za 2021. godinu je 37,83%, što je značajno manje nego što je bilo u prethodnim godinama, gde se taj procenat kreta oko 50%, ali je od izuzetno velikog značaja za stabilnost nadevanja električnom energijom tokom cele godine. Crna Gora je u primjeni EU direktive o velikim postrojenjima za sagorevanje izabrala optav mekanizam koji omogućava elektranine ugalj režim rada od dodatnih 20.000 sati, a koje je termoelektrana Pljevlja iskoristila i može da nastavi da radi jedinako se izvrši ekološka rekonstrukcija. Prvi put od kad je Crna Gora postala članica, odnosno zemlja sa statusom ugovorna strana energetske zajednice, pokrenut je prekršeni postupak protiv Crne Gore i to u slučaju termoelektrane Pljevlja. U cilju rešavanja ovog vrlo zabrinjavajućeg stanja, elektroprivrede je 9. juna 2020. godine potpisala ugovor o ekološkoj rekonstrukciji termoelektrane sa konzorcijumom koji prevodi kineska kompanija Domfrag Electric Corporation, DAC, čiji projekti pokrivaju više od 80 zemalja sveta. Planira se da ekološka rekonstrukcija bude izvedena uz puno poštovanje idejnog projekta i laborata o zaštiti životne sredine, koji je izradila kompanija Stig Energy Services, GmbH, iz Nemačke. Situacija koju danas imamo, prema poslednjem saopštenju Management elektroprivrede Crne Gore, je da je crnogorska delegacija na sastanku sa sekretarijatom energetske zajednice u Beču izrazila spremnost da implementira projekat ekološke rekonstrukcije te pljevlja, koji je već započet, i to što je prije moguće, kako bi termoelektrana Pljevlja mogla raditi u skladu sa veoma jasno definisanim direktivama Evropske unije, koje se odnose na emisije štetnih produkata sagorevanja. Složit ćemo se da je stabilan izvor električne energije od vitalne važnosti za funkcionisanje svake države, a posebno malog sistema kakav je Crna Gora, čija ekonomija zavisna od sektora turizma, dok termoenergetski sektor ima veliki udio u BDP u države. Stoga je izuzetno značajno vodi računa o sledećem ekonomskoj krizi uzrokovnoj pandemiji koronavirusa koja je u velikoj meri pogodila Crnu Goru i otežala realizaciju svih započetih aktivnosti i projekata, posebno onih koji su oslonjeni na međunarodnu saradnju, energetskom bilansu zemlje, njenim potrebama i proizvodnim kapacitetima, energetskom lancu termoelektrana Pljevlja, rudnik uglja Pljevlja, 
elektroprivreda Crne Gore, koji direktno zapošljavaju oko hiljadu i pograđe na Crne Gore, a indirektno u proizvodnom lancu imaju veliki broj kompanija kao i glavne potrošače električne energije, kombinat aluminijuma Podgorica, Željezaru Nikšić i mnogi druge. Ekonomsko-socijalnom uticaju, posebno na ranjive kategorije potrošača na koje se primenjuje politika subvencionisanja električne energije, naknadama za posticanje električne energije iz obnovnijih izvora koje plaćaju domaćinstva preko računa za električnu energiju, uticaju postojeće termoelektrane na životnu sredinu i zdravlje stanovništva, ograničenje emisije štetnih gasova iz najvećih zagađivača, operalizaciju sredstava ekofonda i druge. Stabilno snabdevanje električnom energijom je jedan od ključnih faktora ekonomske stabilnosti svake države i preliva se na sve druge djelatnosti i aspekte društva. Stoga smatram da u procesu transformacije u ovom sektoru treba pristupati postepeno, društveno odgovorno i ne dozvoliti da se energetska stabilnost u jednom trenutku ne dovede u pitanje. Hvala, to bi bilo sve. Thank you very much, Ivanka, for your intervention. And I believe that yes, it's important that the gradualities, as you mentioned, and the stability, of course, uh, for all society. So we, we will reflect on your intervention. Let me now give the floor to the next speaker, uh, Sonia Ristesca. Uh, Sonia, I know you have a presentation that you will share. I would like also if you could a bit to, uh, focus on the, the support to fossil fuels and the risk to lock in, and also um, look into the negatively impact of uh, coal when it comes to health and local environmental pollution and climate change. It will be great if this could emerge from the presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Irina. Um, um, unfortunately, I don't have that in my presentation, so maybe it's just good not to share it. Or maybe just share the slide for because also I want to a bit connect to what the previous speaker actually said that that's mainly that how the transition should go step by step and also be done in a way that the security of supply is not uh, endangered. Um, again, for us to say, of course, uh, as well. Yes, go ahead. Just keep it within five minutes. Thank yes, you. no problem. Yes, just I wanted to, to say, of course, that thank you for for inviting me to to present today. And then um, uh, it's really great to be able to 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 discuss these things uh, um, uh, with all the panelists uh, in 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 all these panels. And then, of course. Um, if you have any questions after this, because we don't have enough time to to discuss this, uh, I'm of course free through my my mail for further exchanges. So please just go to slide four if that's possible. Um, yep, that one. Yes. So uh, no three. Yes, that one. Thank you. So these are this is the most important. No, the previous one, please. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, um, can I have the previous? Yes, thank you. Okay, so this is basically the most important thing. Um, on one side, we have how is the lignite uh, power sector in the Western Balkans currently in the in the region of the um, in, in the entire region, of course, without Albania. And on the other side, we have um, how it can look like in 2040. We did one study uh, titled Lignite uh, Phase Out uh, by 2040 in the Western Balkans study. So my organization, Gona and Regivende with Enervis together. And um, basically what we wanted to show was that switching um, um, off uh, the, the, the Lignite units in the region uh, in the next 20 years, it's possible. It will not jeopardize the security of supply, and uh, it it is also economically sensible uh, decision to be made. Um, when we are discussing the coal phase out, it's quite also important to, to mention that uh, uh, replacing the coal uh, units with um, with renewables is actually a no regret option, and this is where also uh, we come to actually climate change and air pollution because we know how much these power plants uh, pollute. Uh, maybe in the grand scheme of things on global level, that's that's uh, that's quite minuscule. But on on, on local level and regional level, um, on a, um, most of the emissions from the countries actually come from the energy sector because, as we see, uh, almost all the entire fleet is actually older, and the entire fleet is actually older than uh, 30 years. So most of the power plants that are currently in use have been built. 
uh, before I actually uh, ex Yugoslavia uh, fell apart, which actually just shows you uh, in what kind of a condition the sector is. This is also quite important because now is the time to actually make the plans to do the uh, call to clean um, switch. Uh, and uh, this is what we are working on. This is, this is what many people, a lot of my colleagues, which are also here today are working on. And that's basically how can we do that in a way that it's uh, economically feasible, uh, that protects, protects the environment, um, that, um, but uh, as well that the security of supply is not uh, jeopardized. And basically uh, our Green Deal ETS scenario, uh, which is basically that we have uh, an open uh, integrated market in the region and we also have carbon pricing. So this is also quite important. Uh, I'm not sure if we today we touched upon a lot on the carbon pricing, but this is something that will definitely be something that will impact uh, the decisions uh, being made, especially when it comes to building new uh, cold, uh, coal or or lignite units, especially in Serbia, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and in Kosovo. Um, it will have a tremendous impact basically on these decisions because this is something that is coming. First, it's coming at the border of the EU, probably through the carbon border adjustment mechanism. And this is coming uh, because a lot of the countries are already planning, in, planning internal uh, uh, carbon pricing. Uh, in any ways, I just wanted to say that uh, doing the switch from coal to clean, especially focusing on building or ramping up deployment of solar and wind, it's possible in the region of the Western Balkans. Um, and it's not tremendously um, uh, expensive and it won't jeopardize the security of supply if, of course, there is some, um, depending on what you want to, um, or depending on the country and the local circumstances, in some cases, there probably will need to be some gas pickers, so uh, gas power plants uh, when there is no sun, when there is no wind, uh, in order to satisfy the, the peak demand, etc. But uh, uh, in any case, and I, I believe that this is not only what uh, we've discovered through the research, but many studies that you will see also on global level, like the latest IA um, net zero scenarios that basically solar and wind are the future and the Western Balkans are really not different uh, um, uh, than this. Um, so, I mean, I think my five minutes are actually up. I wanted to also maybe mention just uh, on something on North Macedonia, if it's possible, just the last slide, uh, 12, because this is one of the countries that actually does not plan any uh, new uh, fire, uh, uh, lignite fire units, because first of all, yes, it doesn't really have much um, uh, lignite left anyhow. Um, it has unofficially uh, a plan to do the coal phase out. I actually present on this slide, you can see the latest uh, document, which is the NDC, the updated NDC for, uh, which is planned for Glasgow. Uh, and basically there, um, the, the, the country, the government says that they want to uh, uh, basically slash most of the emissions by 2030. If most of the emissions come from the uh, power sector and from uh, the remaining, I would say, one uh, to two um, um, uh, um, uh, but uh, mainly from Eric uh, Bitola, uh, so the one main power plant, actually in North Macedonia, that means uh, actually uh, doing the coal phase out and, and, and shutting down the power plant. Um, so, of course, this is a tremendous opportunity to do um, uh, coal to clean transition, but also to do a really right, just transition, I would say. Uh, unfortunately, currently, there is still no publicly available just transition plans uh, for the remaining power plants. Um, and uh, there are some planned investments in the uh, sum of 3.1 billion by 2027 to replace the lignite units. And of course, uh, there are um, uh, there is always this issue now when we are doing the switch in the region. What are we switching with? So we discussed that we can do that with solar and wind, but a lot of the plants in the countries, and this is not only south, um, this is not only the Western Balkans. This is also Southeast Europe, East Europe, etc. Um, we are discussing about eating up a lot of gas. Uh, for instance, North Macedonia plans around 500k thousand uh, euros for actual uh, uh, gas uh, infrastructure, uh, which the government states that it will be hydrogen ready, which means that after a certain year, 2030, 2035, that it will be able to switch to uh, clean uh, hydrogen or hydrogen from renewables. So this remains to be seen. As I said, now is the time when a lot of the, the, the changes will happen uh, because the, the old sector as it was, is just going to have to be modernized and going to have to be replaced. There is just no other way. And now uh, what we are working on and, and, and 
I would say what uh, different sectors from civil society, media, um, uh, research, etc., are working on is basically finding the right way to not do only the the uh, proper uh, call to clean switch uh, to avoid uh, gas locking, but also to uh, do the just transition in a way that uh, the workers, the employees uh, in in these uh, uh, sectors, in these I would say local communities, do not uh, suffer. So I will stop here and uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sonia, for the brilliant presentation and for really giving an overview of all the important points. You rightly mentioned carbon pricing, which was not uh, discussed today, and this will be a huge uh, game changer for, for the region, of course. Um, so it will put even more pressure to, to the coal phase out. And uh, I know that North Macedonia is really forward looking. We work very closely in North Macedonia, and uh, I can confirm that uh, your um, NDC2 target uh, is really going in the right direction, it's very ambitious, and it's good to know from you that there is also some plan for whole phase out and some funds, 3.5 billion, I think is substantial, put aside to replace full capacity. Um, on these, I would like, I see that there are two questions in the chat, but I will take that at the very end, and I will now give the floor to Victor. Um, Victor, I would like to focus on a bit on the Sofia Declaration, on the political side of things that it's very important for the Western Balkans. And I would like to ask you, uh, so we have this Sofia declaration and it's very, it's a hook, it's a cornerstone document, but what are the, the prevailing barriers that they make anyways, even with this Sofia declaration, this just transition now uh, harder, the challenges, what can you tell us about that? Thank you. Thanks, Irina, and uh, thank you for the invitations. I'm very happy to be here with you today. Well, um, it's uh, it's very obvious that Sosha, uh, that uh, the Sofia Declaration on the Green Agenda for the Western Balkans gives us kind of an end date for the for the uh, lowering of the greenhouse gas emissions, becoming um, uh, carbon neutral, to decarbonize the economies, etc. So, um, in this end date, we actually see uh, that. Um, the huge uh, the huge responsibility of certain industries that, that they actually have in playing towards uh, reducing uh, these emissions today it's not by chance that we are talking about climate in a coal uh, in a coal uh, uh, platform because the high dependency of the region on on uh, on uh, on coal uh, produced electricity so this is actually um, why we will we will have the the energy system will be the one who will have to to make um, one of the corner store cornerstone movements uh, towards lowering the emissions and to actually become uh, climate neutral. So, but uh, we have heard today all of the day today about uh, about the importance of um, of uh, uh, let me put a key work here, a sustainable energy transition, because we have many obstacles on our uh, on our path to actually achieving that. So uh, what this uh, Sofia declaration should do and the process of the green agenda for the Western Balkans, in our opinion, is to actually support the current initiatives that are on in place to actually implement their goals and we are talking here about the energy community treaty who is leading on the on the energy transition and now also on the decarbonization pathway as well with them um, with the transport uh, with the with the transport community treaty uh with the um, uh with the well this is one of the the, the pillars of uh, of uh, of uh, also economic and investment plan. Talk about the coal regions in transition, etc. So we have these initiatives, which should kind of put uh, uh, put themselves in, under one umbrella, not uh, necessarily um, to lead on, but to actually have the 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 green agenda for the Western Balkan putting an added value to all of the, the efforts. And here I'm primarily talking about the flagship projects of the green agenda for the Western Balkans. So they would support actually what is happening on the ground and what those these other initiatives are actually taking it into account. <clears throat> and by this, so um, working towards market liberalization and coupling and what has been a little bit missing from the discussion today is working on the energy efficiency first 
to control the demand and lower and use the energy that we have at our disposal the best possible way that we have and work on storage and ramping up the renewables as much as possible. So, but what is hampering in kind of what are the challenges to actually achieving all of this is that for now we have only a political commitment in the Western Balkans towards uh, climate neutrality by 2050. So we need to actually enshrine that commitment into the laws of the countries of the Western Balkans, that it has a legal obligation. And when once it has, we need a very thorough planning process in order to make milestones by certain date, how much emissions, how much investments do we need, etc. And here again comes um, a very important role that the energy community has been playing in setting the 2030 target and the work that, that the energy community is doing with the national and energy and climate plans, uh, which is uh, which are plans to actually tackle these uh, these issues until 2030. So uh, once we once we have kind of a long term vision and a thorough plan planning for that, we definitely need to 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 take action and. It is very good to have plans, but we have had plans in the past also in the Western Balkans, and we need to uh, make it a very strong uh, to underline that the implementation of those plans is very much important. We have had the 20 2020 targets for the, uh, namely the lowering of the greenhouse gas emissions, the amount of renewables in the energy mix, as well as the energy efficiency targets in the Western Balkans. but. Uh, uh, none of the countries have actually achieved their targets for the 2020. It's a little bit early. I know to talk about this because it was moved until end of 2021. But this is kind of a, uh, what gives us a glance that the commitments that, that the countries have need a thorough planning. And I'm wrapping up. So, uh, <clears throat> but, and this is also related to, to the question. So there are, uh, besides the, the non-implementation of the legislation, we have investment barriers. And moreover, we have a direct and indirect subsidies to call, which hamper and really do not raise awareness of the people, of the engaged stakeholders, actually, it, it plays a role of an enabler to actually be bound to call, and which is a very big problem. But I found a very, uh, one of the most hurtful uh, things that I have heard today is from the representative of the of the, the trade unions in North Macedonia. Hurtful, not in the sense to me, but what is a very unfortunate situation: how the trade unions and how the workers engaged in those regions are not actually being consulted, are not being taken on board during the discussion and the planning. And this is something that it has to actually change because this transition should be owned by the people and it needs a bottom-up approach to engage the citizens first of all affected citizens and then everyone else who depend on that energy production thank you very much victor i think you touched upon very important uh, elements investment barrier of course the subsidies the importance of political commitment but at the same time to embed uh, those political commitments in legally binding legislation and this is what we are working on also the energy community the support of international organizations working on these specific issues engage local communities trade union as much as possible and uh, most importantly focus on energy efficiency and uh, first and foremost implementation Thank you, Victor. I will now give the floor directly to uh, our last speaker, last but not least, Rinora. And I would like for you to focus on Kosovo and what kind of the concrete steps the country like Kosovo that we heard is highly reliant on coal, we know that, I have to do to, uh, to ensure that a coal phase out is also equal as much as possible uh, in the interest of all the communities. Please, Rinora, to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Irina. Uh, it's really hard being the last panelist because a lot has been said. Uh, but given that the question is specifically for Kosovo, then it 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 is a bit um, uh, easier for me because um, just energy transition uh, as a process itself is very important for Kosovo because it was mentioned that is one of the countries that is heavily um, uh, reliant on power uh, on power plants and uh, the high number of employees that are working there, uh, which is mostly men, um, is working in that sector. 
So far, the idea of building a new power plan has been the center of policy making, whereas the future approach to the sector should be the green uh, and the one that takes into account socioeconomic aspects of the country. It was mentioned a lot, and I wouldn't want to stop much on elaborating that. But uh, one thing I want to emphasize is that there is no one size it's all energy transition. Um, such a thing can't can't work. Transition should be done in line with countries' decarbonization targets and its existing infrastructure. Because um, now, I mean, it was mentioned by um, by Sonia, the problem with gas and from an analysis we've done, uh, we've seen that in the Western Balkans and here not eliminating Kosovo either, all of the countries are seeking to exploit gas opportunity uh, and diversify its energy mix. But actually, um, I mean, that is a question or a conference on its own that we can talk uh, about. Is that uh, is that a just transition from coal to gas or from coal to uh, renewables? And I uh, second the second second one. Uh, Kosovo is now um, developing the National Energy and Climate Plan, uh, which is an opportunity to step up ambitions uh, in this field and to define fossil fuel phase out dates and update the current unrealistic national plans that still exist. Investments and targets in Kosovo should take into account the final price imposed at the citizens, but also businesses and communities. Um, one thing that was mentioned is that energy transition should be done uh, in an inclusive manner. Uh, Kosovo's energy strategy uh, was mainly focused on coal, uh, whereas now uh, with a new government, but also the time has come for reviewing the strategy and um, there is a process uh, to review the strategy, uh, but it is important that the development of, of this strategy is done in a transparent and inclusive manner while prioritizing the development of pathways to ensure systematic transformation and navigating the energy transition process from disruption to growth. Um, this would hence entail assessing that technology and energy uh, accommodates development trends and energy transition goals in line with those of the EU. And if it institutes inclusive and all around policies and efforts towards a joint uh, towards a just transition. This, I want to uh, emphasize that um, it was mentioned, I think, by Alexander Matsura that uh, one of the national uh, NECPs uh, that is already submitted, it says that is done by a third party. And I fear that the same is happening with energy strategies because they're not being done with uh, local um, kind of expertise and local voices being heard, uh, but rather uh, local communities and civil society are included just um, during the public consultations, which I fear that it is a bit too late. Uh, and in order to minimize the need to keep old coal plants online, investments in solar and wind and reduction of grid losses need to be ramped up. Uh, especially Kosovo faces a lot of uh, problems in the grid, but also uh, with, um, I mean, electricity theft, which is a problem on its own and um, kind of uh, makes the, the energy sector to lose, or Kosovo as well, to lose a lot of money. Uh, in this process, not only the government should be um, the, the front runner in a way, uh, because all relevant stakeholders should invest in uh, changing the narrative, in helping in upskilling uh, coal workers, and also to produce new generations and experts, and in this case, women uh, to be empowered uh, to start working in clean energy um, 
production because that is kind of a different um, work from from the one from coal, which was mainly men dominated. Um, therefore, uh, I don't want to say that only um, only the government has a stake on on that, but because this event is organized by kind of the main stakeholders uh, and donors, I think the process can be led by uh, you and us as civil society in order to uh, have uh, kind of. I mean, new experts of new technology, um, not only in Kosovo, but the region as well, because all other countries are facing the same problems. I want to stop here uh, so that because I see that the time is um, running and there are a lot of questions. Very much, uh, Rino. It was uh, an excellent intervention. I'm happy that you mentioned women. It's what no one wants to mention gender, but it's important. And I can say that we can see already important elements of this when it comes to just transition in the plans of one of our contracting parties, uh, North Macedonia, including the presence of women on renewables, because we don't have to give it for granted. We also need to play a role there. You talk about inclusive um, and including the civil society early on in the process. I couldn't agree more. And ECP as well should not only consult, but involve early on uh, local communities and all kinds of stakeholders, including, of course, uh, civil society organizations. Thank you very much. Um, we have five more minutes. I would like to go very quickly, pick up one question from the chat and specifically something that you mentioned as well on the investments uh, on the solar and wind. And if you could just in really one sentence, so what is according to you the most pressing obstacle to increase solar and wind investments? I would like to start uh, with Montenegro, with Igor, Jovanka, and then uh, um, with Sonia, uh, Victor, and uh, finally with, uh, with Renora. Very quickly, just one obstacle that, according to you, is preventing the deployment of solar and wind capacity. Igor, do you want to take it? No. Then we go to the next. Jovanka, uh, um, do you want to just give us one element of this? Then we go to Sonia. Sonia, what about uh, your take on this? Do you want yes. to see just one element? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Irina. Ooh, you're making my life difficult. How can you put that in one sentence? There are two, I mean, okay, it, it's not that there are too many. To be optimistic, there are obstacles which can be overcome. Uh, regulatory administrative barriers, uh, not having one-stop shops, um, not having integrated a regional market. The markets are too small, too fragmented. Um, which actually hinders the development of, of, of renewables. Uh, also, the very important thing, not having targets. We do not have targets in the region. What are we striving to? What do we want to achieve is the first thing. So in order to be able to plan accordingly you know, how much we want to upscale uh, each year, each fifth year, et cetera, et cetera. And also, uh, really, um, at least announcing coal phase out would assist in bringing investors because at least you will know what do you need to replace, how much uh, from the capacity, so how many megawatts do you need to replace uh, with what. So these are, I would say, the one of the main uh, barriers uh, in in not utilizing the potentials that the region has in wind and in solar. Thank you very much, Sonia. And I will also add that you also tabled the clean energy package would also help most probably. And uh, Victor, in order, do you want to add one last thing on this? What is according to you one pressure that is spent in this deployment? No, that's fine. I mean, Sonia did a great job. I would just want to say that, for instance, uh, countries uh, not uh, not rarely put caps on the renewables and on the capacities that they want to build for a certain period, and they put this as a threshold and do not revise their policies uh, uh, after one year or two years. But the other one is that actually um, you, the scheme in which the renewables are deployed in the Western Balkans currently is not perfect, is not functional. And uh, the, as as it has been advised, and as we have some positive um, positive examples, we need to actually have a, an auction-based system in the Western Balkans, which would uh, not only guarantee an open competition, but also the lowest possible price for that project. 
So this uh, and which means lower uh, amount to be paid by the by the customers uh, and the consumers. So shifting from uh, uh, feeding tariff to real auctions and of course the market. Uh, Inora, one last word from your side. Yes, uh, I would like to say that uh, in order to boost the energy sector, uh, technical conditions should be um, created and administrative uh, banners in a way should be removed uh, so that existing and future capacities can be developed with small funds because optimal conditions must be created for the development of renewable energy capacities by households and by businesses. Um, so I think that is really important because then when we have more investments in small scale, then uh, also the, the, the mindset will change. Uh, but at the same time, the government should, uh, should in a way, subsid subsidize to a certain extent, if necessary, uh, in order to provide opportunities for this sector to develop naturally. Because then uh, it's basically when we see the flourishment of all this that we're talking, because communities uh, then benefit. Yes. Yes, Rinora, I couldn't agree more. We don't have to forget the local communities that are also prosumers, and of course, the importance of them as energy producers and energy communities, so small scale solar and wind does also play an important role. And on this, we are 55. I will give them five minutes more. I will now give the floor to Elodie for the closing remarks. Many thanks for the panel. I think it was really an excellent debate. And uh, Elodie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irina. Thank you very much also to all the panelists for these very rich exchanges. Um, I think now it, it's time to, to close the, the, the meeting. So first of all, I would like to Thank again the keynote speakers, all the moderators, and also, of course, uh, all of you uh, speakers and also who uh, participants who have joined the meeting today. Um, apologies for the inconvenience regarding the interpretation. I hope um, it was fixed now and you were able to follow all the uh, exchanges. And um, just one note also, on when preparing the event, we, we paid particular attention um, to invite people directly concerned by the transition. So we hope that you find the exchanges uh, useful and, uh, and interesting. So the, the event continues tomorrow. Uh, we will convene to the, uh, tomorrow at, um, at 2 p.m. Um, Central European and Summer Time. And if you're joining from Ukraine, that will be 3 p.m. Then we have uh, also a packed agenda. And if you're wondering, um, what is uh, Sokotaya doing, for instance, we'll have a short presentation um, from the, someone from the, from the Sokotaya. We'll be also discussing lessons learned and synergies with the initiative for coal regions in transition in the European, in European Union. Then, um, if you're also curious about um, the, um, the activities of the international partners, such as the World Bank, for instance, so we'll have a dedicated session for that and uh, all uh, presentations will be will be will be given by um, by the seven international partners and then we'll um, close the meeting with having one full hour to to present to the exchange program that was also uh, mentioned earlier on by um, Spino. so really on the exchange program that we want to to um, implement within this uh, this initiative so um, I look forward to um, to have a uh, further exchanges with you. I hope you uh, enjoy this first day. It was very rich and intense, and um, I hope to see you all tomorrow uh, again. Thanks again. Bye bye.